Before I introduce today's guest, I want to tell you a little bit about our sponsor, thegreatcoursesplus.com. It's an app you can get on your phone. Here's my phone face. Here's the app. You touch on the app and it opens it up and you can just scroll through hundreds and hundreds of courses, uh, which themselves each have a dozen to two dozen lectures to choose from. So the great thing about this is that um, instead of just uh, purchasing or renting an entire course in which you have to then grind through all the lectures to take it, with thegreatcoursesplus.com, you can pick and choose. So I typically now don't listen to an entire course. I, I listen to maybe half to three quarters of the lectures or just find something I'm particularly interested in. So, for example, I just uh, started listening to this one on um, World War II, the Pacific Theater, after seeing that film on Midway. Uh, and, uh, so you click on that, which I do here, and then you get this whole series of lectures and you can pick any of them that you want. For example, the road to war in the Pacific, 1931 to 41, you have the battle of Midway, of course, and Pearl Harbor. And there's actually a lot that happens after that is 24 total lectures. You can listen to them audio or video. I usually listen to them on audio when I'm cycling or driving or just doing chores and whatnot. But the videos are great as well. They've gone to great uh, lengths to provide uh, graphics and photographs and so forth. So that's great. At any rate, it's uh, free for my listeners for a free trial. That is to say, you can go on greatcoursesplus.com slash salon and register. And then you get a couple of weeks of free content and you can skip around and listen to any one of thousands of lectures uh, I've taught two of these courses myself. They're professionally produced in a studio, so the sound quality is great. The visuals are great, all professionally done, and uh, it's really a great way to be an autodidact, particularly in, uh, when we're in social isolation. So give it a shot. Again, go to www.thegreatcoursesplus.com slash salon, and then our uh, podcast will get registered as that, and you'll get uh, free uh, access to the entire library for a couple of weeks. It's great. So check it out. Thanks for listening. My guest today is Leonard Mladenow in his new book, Stephen Hawking, A Memoir of Friendship and Physics. Uh, Len is the, um, he was a Caltech professor of physics. He also taught science writing there. His previous books include the bestsellers, A Briefer History of Time that he co-authored, co-authored with Stephen Hawking. The Grand Design that he also co-authored with Stephen Hawking, which was quite an original work that we'll be uh, discussing in this podcast. Subliminal, about um, the subconscious mental processing and all the various subliminal ways and influences in our lives. Uh, my favorite book of his probably is The Drunkard's Walk, it, which is about how randomness controls much of what happens in life, in our personal lives, as well as in economies and politics and society and business and so forth. Uh, I actually use that book in my Skepticism 101 course at Chapman University because uh, it explains so many things that we think of as having some other causal vector than chance. He also co-authored with Deepak Chopra, War of the World Views, as well as Elastic, The Upright Thinkers, Feynman's Rainbow, and Euclid's Window. So Len has covered Feynman, Euclid, uh, Deepak Chopra, and, uh, and of course now Stephen Hawking. So we, uh, we talk about all, all the great questions, really. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is the universe created? Uh, where did the universe come from? Why is it designed the way it is? Apparent design. Their title, Grand Design. Design is used in a very bottom-up scientific way, not a top-down way. Uh, but probably everybody knows that already. Anyway, I give you uh, Leonard Malad now with a really deeply moving, personal, touching account of his friendship and professional working relationship with the great Stephen Hawking. Leonard Malad now, thanks for coming on the uh, podcast. Nice to see you again. Always great to see you, <laughs> In Michael. In these crazy times. So uh, your new book, you've got another one out here, is called Stephen Hawking. A Memoir of Friendship and Physics. I love the cover. I take it that is a black hole with Hawking radiation? It's, well, it's an artist's consumption of that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that would actually look like. Um, well, about a millionth of a degree. Uh, it, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, cooler looking than that. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, that's probably what he was most famous for, at least in the first part of his professional life, right, was Hawking radiation 
that's definitely what he was most most famous for. Yeah, uh, in in the book, I I talk about the different uh, research programs that he had and and what they meant. And he had, he had I, I identified about five major programs, and and that was probably the third one, and the one that he's that really uh, made a big splash. That was in his doctoral dissertation. No, so so his doctoral dissertation, uh, he he was it was interesting. He wasn't a very uh, uh, studious student when he was at, at Oxford and at Cambridge. He was still finding himself too until he got diagnosed uh, with ALS. And strangely, that made him take a completely changed his life and made him look for something that would be meaningful in, in life and and something that he would be passionate about. And he found that in in cosmology. And so he totally turned from someone who liked to goof off and party and not do a lot of work to someone who's extremely focused. And as the disease moved on, he became more and more focused. And as he had less that he could do physically, uh, it was natural to, to live in his mental world. And so his PhD was really on its way to being a pretty mediocre uh, PhD dissertation uh, until one day uh, his office mate, Bernard Carr, who's a professor still in England today, uh, told him about a, a lecture that he'd seen by Roger Penrose. And, and Stephen had been going to Penrose's lectures, but he missed this one. And in this lecture that Carr told him about, it, it changed Stephen's life because it was about Penrose's work um, on black holes. And he was, uh, uh, Penrose was interested in showing that when a star collapses under its own weight after it finishes burning out its, its energy and it cools and it collapses, that it really collapses down to a single point, as opposed to a situation where, uh, because of the chaotic uh, nature of the star, as it collapses, it might be that different parts fly past each other. They're not quite coming to the same point, and they just pass each other and then keep going and it re-expands. And he wanted to show that that Einstein's theory showed that it really connects down, collapses down to a point, and it turns out to be a point of infinite quantities of singularity. So that was uh, Penrose's work. And uh, Stephen took that and he, he, he did what he usually does. He, <laughs> he kind of twisted a little bit in his own way. And he said, what, about the, what does that say about the universe? Uh, I can maybe, ex I can rever if I reverse the collapse of a black hole, it's an expansion. And if I apply it to a universe instead of the black hole, what does that tell me? And he showed that Einstein's equations uh, lead, um, he eventually showed, he started to show this in his dissertation, that Einstein's equations lead uh, to the Big Bang theory. Uh, they predict that everything started from the Big Bang. And he made that chapter four of his dissertation after he had three kind of um, not, um, you know, not, not so great chapters, uh, which were basically attacking another theory called the steady state mm -hmm. theory at the time. And he added this fourth chapter and that caused quite a splash. And then he actually worked with Penrose afterwards to work out the details. So that was his first uh, yeah. His first big step. Yeah, and that was long before he became famous. I, I think most listeners to this podcast will have the rough outline of his life. I mean, there's been many biographies, documentaries, and now, of course, a, a major Hollywood feature film, which was just spectacular. I, I watched it again uh, the other night just in preparation for this that, you know, it, um, Eddie, um, what was his name who played Hawking? Um, okay. Eddie Redmay. Phenomenal acting job he did to capture all the little subtle kind of motions and deterioration that Stephen went through all the way to the facial expressions and tics he had and, and how to try to read those. And after reading you, your book, I could kind of see in his face how he uh, was able to communicate with just the eyebrow or, you know, twist of the part of his lips or that kind of thing. Uh, I think a lot of people have this idea that's mistaken that um, his physics was elevated beyond maybe what it should have been because he was so famous because of his disability. But as you show, and as you just explained, you know, his major contrib uh, many of his major contributions came before anybody even knew who he was outside of the physics community. But within the physics community, what he did was considered very good or highly respected or, or, or it's significant. Oh yeah. He was a, a, a truly a momentous pioneer. Uh, he, 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 when he started in the early 60s, people didn't care much about uh, cosmology or black holes, about the origin of the universe or black holes. Uh, they, they, you know, physics, as a theorist, I think of physics usually as a theoretical mathematical yeah. science, but, you know, it's really an experimental science. And 95% of the physicists are experimentalists. And that's 
you know, a theory is not very useful if you don't connect it with observations or experiments. And the problem with both black holes and the origin of the universe in the early 1960s was that we couldn't really see anything. We couldn't, we thought we had pretty much people did not believe they would ever see a black hole and we couldn't look back to the origin of the universe either. I mean, we can, by looking far away, we can look back in time because light takes time to travel, but we couldn't go that far back. So it was, um, these kinds of issues were mostly the, the stuff of, um, very mathematical types and not thought to be uh, extremely relevant to, to, to the real, real physics that we can measure. And uh, Stephen didn't care about that. It, it, it really interested him. And he was one of the people, along with Penrose, uh, who really, by his work and his ideas, and along with some observations that started to happen around that time, took that field and, and made it from like a real backwater to the hottest or one of the hottest areas in physics. So he was extremely influential. Uh, I think the media, not not physicists, but the media tends to blow that out of proportion, mm. and they make everyone an Einstein. And 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 he wasn't an Einstein; he knew he wasn't, and he didn't. He kind of laughed when people <laughs> exaggerated his uh, his stature. Um, I say in the book, for example, that when uh, in his early days that he would go to Caltech, well, he would go to, went to Caltech pretty much every year for thirty or more years. But uh, when he was first starting there, uh, there were these two real uh, iconic physicist, uh, Richard Feynman, who I wrote Feynman's Rain Rule about, whom I knew when I was at Caltech in those days, um, and Murray Gelman. And uh, when Stephen was there visiting for his one month each year, uh, he, he, not only wasn't he the, the best physicist in the world, but he was only the third best <laughs> physicist at Caltech. on the fourth floor of Lauritsen Laboratory because the other two, those two guys were there. So not, not to take anything away from Stephen, uh, there are, but he was one of the greatest physicists of his time, but to say he was one of the greatest physicists of the century, depending on how many you count, yeah. you know, is, is a bit of an exaggeration, but he, he had an enormous influence in, in physics world, and, and that, that's the area that he, he really took that and, and built yeah. it uh, hit along with couple others. Yeah, I thought you you handled that well in the book. I mean, no one's Einstein, right? Only one there's only one Einstein and maybe only Einstein Yeah, Einstein, and the only yeah. maybe comparable person in history would be Newton. Um and then after that, I mean, they're not even on the on the chart to be measured. So after that, you have someone like Feynman and Gelman who are maybe six standard deviations out from the mean. So maybe Hawking is only five standard deviations out from the mean. You know, it's not like <laughs> he, right. it's still pretty spectacular. What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, you know, when you get to the point of saying, well, how much of a genius was yeah. he? Uh, it was either genius, 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 or the genius, <laughs> right. genius. It, it, yeah. it's, it's kind of silly. I don't even like to, to talk about that. But, well, um, I like that. What but, I like about your memoir is that you're a, uh, you're a professional theoretical physicist yourself and a real humanist in the sense that you, you know literature, you know how to write. You've written for Star Trek, and you know, and, and and you understand how to communicate clearly. So you you were able to put all that together in a memoir that really captures that fairly, I think. Um, and that you know, he really had to shift his thinking, his genius, away from mathematical equations to this. And maybe try to explain this because I don't think I get it. How you think geometrically about equations? I mean, I don't even know what that means. Well, that's really one of uh, there's so much that was uh, both inspirational and fascinating about Stephen and working with him. And one of the things was how his he used his disability, uh, how it changed him. But he he, he evolved, he adapted, and 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 got uh, abilities uh, from that 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 he wouldn't have had. It gave him an actual advantage over other people. And uh, one of the things that he started to do in the 70s, uh, um, when he couldn't write, uh, saw that he couldn't write equations anymore, was to think geometrically rather than what we might call algebraically, uh, or in the physics term, in terms of you know, functional analysis, we would say. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's many different kinds of math that go into physics. Um, but one can divide, in, uh, in a way, uh, approaches uh, into those two two general uh, topics. Um, most physicists use both. Uh, and the geometric is in some often a deeper way of understanding things, but the other more algebraic or analytical methods uh, are, are usually more used by people in everyday research often. 
Now, what, what the difference is, you can, I can illustrate it uh, with something you get in, I think, in high school or in, in middle school where you learn, um, uh, you know, you, you learn geometry at some yeah. point. So you're learning about shapes and theorems, uh, like the some of the the angles in the triangle is 180, or for a right uh, a right triangle, uh, the sum of the sides, the two sides equals the square of one plus the square of the other equals the square of the hypotenuse, right. Pythagorean theorem, and so forth. Then at some point uh, you take algebra where you're working with equations. So x, you know, x squared plus 3x plus 2 equals 0, for example, an algebraic equation. And, and I, I think uh, many people at some point take what's called analytic geometry, where you mm -hmm. learn how you, you use those equations to describe uh, what you see on a graph. So you draw the axes and points, and you can label the points, and you can describe the, um, what you see on the graph with uh, algebraic equations. But you can also look at the same picture and think of it geometrically mm -hmm. from, with shape, just like Euclid did. And in fact, you could you could prove the Pythagorean theorem, for example, purely mm. geometrically by drawing shapes and squares, and you label you you lay them in one inside the other, and you move things around, and you show that uh, eventually you can show that if you just move things around a little bit purely geometrically without writing one equation, you can prove the Pythagorean theorem that a squared plus b squared equals c right. squared, where c is the hypotenuse. Okay, or you can write equations down, uh, algebraic equations for the sides, and and you can. And you can prove it without any pictures using pure algebra. So that's an example of how you can use uh, an either an algebraic equation-like approach or a geometric picture-like approach. So you could imagine a and, black hole uh, in that kind of analysis. Right. So Stephen would imagine light ray. He would imagine a black hole. He would imagine how the space is curved in certain ways around the black hole, what that means. He would imagine particles shooting toward it or light rays or sometimes two black holes going to collide. And, and and he had his way of knowing what the theorems of physics said would happen to these things, and he would think of it that way, whereas uh, other people would write down these very complicated uh, differential geometric mm. uh, equations with, with, with letters and numbers, uh, and they would analyze it that way. So, um, so there are two different approaches, and I say most people – you use both or you use the analytical, but you have a geometric picture in your head. But even in, you know, in, 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 in uh, relativity and quantum theory, uh, we, we physicists, we, we, we use abstract spaces that are not necessarily the physical space, but in those abstract spaces, they might have infinite dimensions. We still can picture things pointing and what happens mm -hmm. if they, you know, go inside or they're right angles or things happen. And so he would think that way. Whereas other people would think in terms of uh, uh, equations. Would Feynman diagrams be an example of that? That's a good. Uh, that's a good example. So Feynman also thought very uh, graphically. So that's something that he and and Stephen had in mm. common. So uh, he yes. So he he. Th th there's a, the way that we calculate what happens when elementary particles interact and collide is extremely complicated. And uh, the equations for it are very long and involved, and there's many of them and many, many pages of them if you, uh, if you want to calculate the results of what happens. And, and mathematics was very complicated, and Feynman noticed certain regularities that allow him to translate, to, to, to talk about physical processes on a piece of paper, just draw them, like um, electron coming in, positron coming in this way, and then they, you know, antiparticles annihilate. Uh, and a, a photon of light goes that way, another photon goes that way. So he draws a picture of the interaction uh, of all kinds of various interactions. And he found that with ways of associating different mathematical pieces with the pictures. Mm. So instead of thinking in a very abstract way a, a, as you're doing the math and you have to write down all these horrible series of equations, Einstein would just have, uh, Einstein Feynman would just write down some pictures and you know what the pictures mm. meant and then you, and then you can just add it up that way. It was really beautiful, but when he first did it, he didn't really do all the math to prove that it worked, and, and there were a lot of doubters, mm. uh, you know, just like some of Stephen's right. work. Uh, and then people came back after him and did the math to show that what he did actually was actually worked. I can't remember if I ever told you the story of Feynman's van, but in, in the 90s, 
John Gribben, the science writer and physicist, came came to Caltech. Well, he came to L.A. for his book tour. So I hosted him at, at Caltech for a, a lecture on, I think it was one of his Schrodinger's cat books. I, I can't remember which one it was. At any rate, he, he, he really wanted to see Feynman's van uh, with the Feynman diagrams on the side of this van. It's this huge 1970-something cargo van. Anyway, so I didn't, I didn't know much about the van or where it was. So I, I found Ralph Lighton, who was Feynman's drumming partner, and uh, he said, yeah, I think the van is in the park behind this gas station in San Gabriel off the 210 freeway, you know. And so we went in search of Feynman's van and I'm driving. I have I have a van. I have a Ford cargo van. And, and John Gribben and I are driving this van down the 210 freeway. And I had a cassette player. So we're playing Feynman uh, drumming songs on a cassette tape that you could buy at the Caltech bookstore. <laughs> so we're listening to Feynman uh uh, drumming, and then I get off. I, f- I forget what the exit was off the 210 freeway, and we're driving around. And I got lighting on the phone, and he's like, "Yeah, try this station." So we find this gas station, and there it is. It's parked behind the gas station. Uh-huh. Weeds growing up into the wheel wells. And, you know, it's all faded in the in the California sun. And anyway, as you know, it's been uh, resurrected since then. It's now protected, and and, and so on. But. Um, but I thought that was really funny. It's almost iconic. There's a story, I don't know if it's true, that you know Feynman lived in Altadena, just up the street from, from where you are and where I used to live. And there was a story that somebody stopped him at a red light or whatever and said, how come you have Feynman diagrams on your van? And he said, because I'm Feynman. <laughs> it must have gotten quite the response. If that's a true story, that might be apocryphal. But if it's true, it's a great story. Um, all right, so... Um, just staying on the physics for a little bit. So, um, uh, so chapter four of, of, of um, Hawking's dissertation is about this. Um, if you run the universe backwards in time, you eventually get to this point of singularity. So maybe that's the origin of the Big Bang. So what's the status of that particular theory of the origin of the Big Bang? And what would cause a sing- point of singularity to bang in the first place? What was there before that singularity point was there? Where did it come from? And, and, and those kinds of big questions. Okay, well, yeah. boy, you, you, just those questions, I could finish our, uh, our yeah, our hour, yeah. <laughs> Why not to? Uh, well, let me see. What would be the, the, um, but just, just where, where that status of that particular theory is that. Oh, well, the status, okay, so one of the things that, that Stephen, uh, uh, okay, well, I, let me start by saying that picture that he derives is based on general relativity. Uh, general relativity, Einstein's uh, theory of motion and gravity. So, you know, Newton had his different laws. He had laws of motion, which tell how things react to forces. And then he had the laws of one particular force, gravity. He didn't know much about electricity, magnetism, certainly not the nuclear forces, but he described how masses create a force of gravity. And, he, and then his laws of motion describe how um, objects react to any force, uh, in particular gravity. So he could, so he could use his, his theory of gravity and his laws of motion to tell you how the planets move, but also how things on Earth react to the Earth's gravity and so on. It was very successful. So Einstein uh, came along and and he he basically did the same thing, but he he basically uh, threw out Newton's laws of motion and Newton's laws of gravity. So, but but still, what he had in common with Newton was he didn't treat electricity and magnetism and the nuclear forces. Mm. Okay. So the, Einstein's general theory of relativity is a theory of two things, how things move when, when gravity is, when masses are present, and, and, and how masses create gravity and gravity interacts. Now, in Einstein's theory, it's a little different from Newton's because he doesn't treat gravity really as a force, but it's something that, that warps space-time, and that's what changes your motion, rather than in Newton's picture, it creates a force which acts on you and changes your motion. Yeah. And anyway... Um, it's a very, very different theory in its concepts, its conceptual structure, and its mathematics. Um, so, but what, but but it, it generally describes large-scale properties of the universe uh, because gravity doesn't have much effect on protons and electrons uh, because they're very light and they have electromagnetic forces that affect them much more strongly. But uh, in, since there's both positive, positive and negative charges, if you look at large things that are conglomerations like the stars. Uh, they, they don't have that big of an electric field because they have pluses and minuses inside them, but they've got a lot of mass, mm-hmm. right? So, so general relativity and gravity tend to take over on the large scale. So when people were looking at what happens, what's the history of the universe, they, they looked, you, they, they used Einstein's theory of general relativity to describe that. 
they didn't use uh, they didn't need to use electromagnetic theory or quantum theory they just did they focused on that and that's what Stephen did when he showed that there's a big bang hmm. but, well uh, sometime later in one of his uh, I will jump in, in the chronology the uh, um, this was I think his third uh, or his fourth really his fourth um, big project he said he said, well, I, I think I was wrong. He, he liked to do that. He liked to do, take what he did, and, 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 uh, or he was at least maybe he didn't like to, but he was open to it. Many people have a, d- develop a theory, especially if it becomes well-known and famous, and then they feel very defensive about it. They, they won't accept changes, and he wasn't like that. So he said at some point, this thing that I did in my PhD thesis was eh, not, not quite mm. kosher. Because we, really should, uh, we really need to look at quantum theory and its effects on the early mm. universe. And why is that? That that that's because quantum theory is is very important. So so quantum theory superseded Newton's laws of motion, and in a different way than Einstein's general relativity did. So they they kind of they 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 clash with each other. They're not compatible. We have laws of motion and gravity from Einstein. And we have laws of motion and electricity and magnetism as a force, and the nuclear forces uh, as a quantum theory. So we have three of the four forces in a quantum theory of motion, and we have the fourth force with a non-quantum theory, which we call classical mm-hmm. theory. So, so what Stevens said at some point is he, he, the reasoning was, other people were also looking at this, that as you go back in time, as the universe was smaller and smaller, all the mass and energy that we see in the universe today was packed into a very small, much smaller and smaller space. And, in, and when things get very close and very sm- to each other and very small, then you have to take into account quantum theory. So what you really have to do is take into account both quantum theory and uh, general relativity if you want to really describe the beginning of the hmm. universe. So that idea of the Big Bang uh, is not really – I mean, it's what, it's what Einstein's theory on its own predicts. But when we mix quantum theory in, we get a different picture. And we have to be careful when you mi- we mix it in because – I'm sure your your viewers know that uh, that it's one of the main goals of physics today, of theoretical physics, is to find a unified theory, and that's what we mean—a theory that not only includes electricity, and magnetism, and nuclear forces, but also includes gravity, and presumably also, therefore, gives us a quantum now, a quantum theory of gravity. So mm. it's quantum motion, all the forces, including mm. gravity. But we don't have that. So how do you? How do you apply the ideas of quantum theory and the ideas of general relativity to the same system, which is the early yeah. universe? And no one knows. I mean, everyone has their own people who work on that. They have their own way, and you have to be very mm-hmm. careful because they are part where they contradict each other. So you use a little principle from this for this. You use a little principle from that, and you, you try and put patch something together that, that works. And that's why it's not just cut and dried. But our, our current theory of the universe, and Stephen was a pioneer in this as well, is not that there was a beginning like mm. that. In fact, if you go back far enough, the matter and energy is squeezed, are squeezed together so, so tightly that you know, mass warps space and time, and the, the more uh, concentrated it is, the more it warps that. that it's, so that if you go back far enough to where the universe was small enough, there is no, uh, the, the, our idea of time doesn't really fit mm. anymore. Space and time are completely intertwined, and Stephen used to like to say we really had four dimensions of space. Mm. So you cannot go with, in the modern view, and especially in Stephen's view, you cannot go back and trace time backwards all the way to a beginning, to zero, and say, what happened before that? Because before you get that, time just disappears and you have just space. Hmm. So it's not just just an epistemological problem that we simply can't know, or, or, or an ontological problem of it's not knowable. You're saying this falls right out of the equations. It just stops. Right. And, and well, yeah, it uh, stops. Is no, a funny not that, word because, it stops uh, is not the right word. <laughs> you, there's nothing to talk about. No longer. Uh, if you go the further at some point, if you go back, back in time, the concept of time, as we understand it, and we have an intuition for it as well, no longer makes sense. So so the question of where does it begin and what happened what was first doesn't make any sense right. either. Uh, and that's what comes out of the equations we we believe. Right. When when Hawking would say something like, "I discovered that X, whatever black holes radiate," and then later I discovered that they don't radiate. When he uses the word "discover," 
he means through these reasoning, uh, mathematical, geometrical. It's not like some experimentalist tested it and found out he was wrong. Right. Completely <laughs> correct. So as a theorist, if I discover something, it means that uh, I show it mathematically. And uh, sometimes you're able to prove something, but usually not. I talk in the book about how uh, it, people have the wrong idea about theoretical physics, that it's an exact mathematical science. In, in, in vol- like Mathematics is exacting. They, those guys and women, they, they demand proofs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, they, they, they estimate things, but generally, if you're doing a proof every step of the proof, you're just not, not like, this is probably true. It's like, you know, but in physics, it is. It's the opposite. We can almost never prove anything. We can't solve our equations. We can't even solve the equation. Just take a simple equation for the helium the helium atom. Yeah, okay, two protons and, and, and two electrons. It, it's, it's one step more complicated than hydrogen, which is one proton <laughs> and one electron. And we can't solve helium. We can't even solve the helium atom. So, so what do we do? We we use approximations, and, and the and we just so a lot of physics is inventing or discussing or arguing about the approximations, and then using them to get whatever information you can extract. But it's not usually a proof. So when we say we discover something, it might not even mean that we've done the math to show that it must be. We've we've done a kind of <laughs> math which we think probably shows that it most likely is right. And of course, we have the experimentalists yeah. uh, uh, working with us to 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 knock us back when we're <laughs> wrong. But uh, uh, you know, physics has developed. It, 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 it's 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 rare that people accept something based on these approximations, and that if it show we show that it's wrong later. It, in the beginning, when people are exploring it, there are those who say it's this way, and those who say it's that way, and eventually that sorts itself out. And we've done a pretty good job uh, with that. I mean, we, we measure things now to 15 decimal places, and, and, and the theory is correct. Right. So, um, and now I'm, I've already confused myself. I forget uh, which one is the correct one. Black holes do radiate or they don't radiate? Uh, well, okay, we've never seen the radiation, uh, and, and we don't have much hope of seeing it, because, um, but that doesn't mean we won't, because... Um, uh, it's possible to see, but it's, it, it's really, uh, if, you, if you were to equate the radiation, a degree of radiation to a temperature would be about, a, depending on the black hole, a millionth of a degree, it's very, very faint and, and um, it's, it's not very robust. Uh, but mathematically, everyone believes that, that he was right and that they do mm-hmm. radiate. Uh, in fact, not only uh, I, there was a lot of opposition at first when he, when he proposed that, but uh, since then, it's been re-derived by many different methods, by different mm-hmm. people. And everyone would take his result and go, I'm not sure I like the way he mm-hmm. combined general relativity and quantum theory. I'm going to do it my favorite way and see what happens. And then they find the same result. And then someone else from a different direction does it. And they find the same result. So it's been reproduced many, many times. So people are very confident in it. And in Israel, they even did an experiment with an analog system. That means a system that kind of isn't. Uh, what Stevens talked about, masses uh, collapsing under gravity uh, to form black holes, but they 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 they, they, they investigated fluids. Mm. There's a kind of a quantum particle that can travel in a fluid, a, a quantum excitation of sound called a phonon. So we have photons of light, we have phonons of sound, and they they made a, a system that 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 is analogous to uh, the black holes with photons and mass and gravity. They made one out of fluids, and they did observe what's the equivalent of Hawking radiation in that experiment. It, it, it's, um, it's not literally the same thing, but it's more evident. So this has to do with the loss of information or not, right? So if it- well, what Stephen did was, so, so first, you know, one of his, his um, second big research program was to formulate laws of black holes. So he formulated, and these are all classical based on general relativity. Mm-hmm. Then he, he was uh, investigating some thing, which I won't get into unless you ask me, but, but he was looking into something, trying to debunk it, when he discovered that not only was the thing he was looking into true, but even other things hmm. were true that are even just as, even more shocking. And that's where he discovered Hawking radiation. Hmm. So he, <clears throat> he was able to change his thinking again and contradict his earlier laws hmm. of 
of black holes, which were based on general relativity, because this new thing was based on applying quantum theory to black mm. holes. And so what he found was that, um, that because of the uncertainty principle around the uh, around, you know, a black hole has a horizon uh, that once you cross it, you can't get out. Right. And things that are just outside of it, it's in, in space that's just outside of it because of quantum theory. It's never empty. It's creating pairs of, of, of particle, antiparticle, pairs of particles that are only in existence for a very small amount of time then disappear again that mm. that's that's what the quantum vacuum is like so it's not like nothing there there's all these we call them virtual particles coming in and out of existence if there's a black hole there he showed that things could get captured by that before they can come out of existence mm. again and that something else gets uh, gets let out and 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 the the net of this process is that that black holes diminish in size that they radiate out so he he found that quantum theory says that black holes should radiate out, but the lifetime of which they will radiate away makes it impractical to observe. It's much longer than the, the life of the universe, mm. but it's theoretically it's happening. Mm. It's at a very low amount, as they say, like a millionth of a degree, and it takes you know an almost unimaginable number of years till it disappears. But that doesn't matter to the theorists because what, what what's really important is is it happening or not, and 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 this has a lot of consequences if a black hole radiates out eventually disappears because the stuff that fell in was supposed to be lose its identity and never be able to communicate with the outside right. again so now if it's all coming out that's a big contradiction well, if you fell into the black hole would the pattern of information that represents leonard malad now be gone forever or is it still in there somewhere so there you go <laughs> that, that is the question from my point of view uh nothing would happen as i as like well there's some theories now that that's not even true anymore, but I won't go okay. into that. But <laughs> up until a few years ago, people said nothing. I would cross the horizon. Nothing would happen. Of course, what would happen is I'd be pulled apart mm -hmm. and torn to pieces because the gravity is so strong in a black hole. And, and, and it's stronger when you get nearer to the center that, that the, that the gravity, if I'm like falling in feet first, the gravity at my feet would be so much stronger than the gravity here that I would just be pulled apart just because uh, the differential is so great because the gravity Don't is so great. Don't you guys call that, that the spaghettification of, of somebody? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kip Thorn, I think he came up with that. Yes, yeah, so he turned into spaghetti. But assuming that I can survive that, I'm like Gumby. And uh, I wouldn't notice that I passed the horizon. Um, and people on the outside would have a totally different mm. picture of me because they, they would see me disappear and, and never be able to hear from me again. And in fact, they would, and from their point of view, I wouldn't even... I wouldn't go into the black hole. <clears throat> Time for me would, would seem to slow down to them so that I would, as I got closer, would go slower and slower and slower. Mm. My heart would be slower and slower. The atoms in me would oscillate slower. In fact, and the light for me would be so shifted because of the slowing down of time that I would just disappear and be kind of stuck on the mm. outside. Anyway, that you, you are either way you're mm. lost, right? And so the information in a you know, black hole is not supposed to have the information inside of it. I'm, I, I, if I fall in, a black hole only has um, a, a few um, properties. It, has a, it, it can have a spin. It can have a charge. Okay. Uh, let's forget about those because most of the black holes we talk about in everyday talk, nowadays everyday talk is black <laughs> holes, you know. Don't have that. That's just uh, red herrings in a way. But it has a mm. mass. So really, it's only the mass that determines all the properties of the black hole. That means if I fall in and I weigh 180 pounds and you throw in a 180 pounds bag of salt, we're very different. I hope, I hope <laughs> me from a bag of salt before we go into the black yeah. hole. After the black hole, we're, we're, everything's been erased but our mm. mass. That's the idea. So if the black hole then radiates away, what happens? And so the question is, um, does the information really, was it in there? Does it co somehow get come back encoded into radiation mm -hmm. or is it really lost? And that's something that people are still arguing about. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, everyone has another story from the nineties. I had uh, Frank Tipler come uh, speak at Caltech um, on his book, the physics of immortality. I don't know if you remember this book, uh, <laughs> you know, and he's a, he's a professional uh -huh. theoretical physicist also. And, and uh, I, but I didn't want to put him on just by himself because you know he's he's making a pretty far out there argument. So I approached Kip, 
Thorne because I knew him and he was supportive of the skeptics because he's concerned about pseudoscience and irrationality in society at large. Anyway, uh, he said, no, I, I'm not going to debate him. I, I don't do debates. And uh, but maybe I'll come and sit in the back and just listen to what he has to say. So I'm like, OK, so Frank starts in on his theory. Uh, this one, I think, was not grounded in black holes retaining the information. I think it was the universe expands forever and the information of, of who we are expand goes out with it, and you can recapture it in the far future of the universe through a, if I get this right, it was a far future virtual reality computer that would essentially be God that could resurrect all of us in a, in, in a virtual reality, reconstruct every person who ever lived or even could have lived. And the, the size of the computer would be like 10 to the 10 to the 183 bits or anyway so uh but but during frank's talk uh, kip sent a little note to me and said i decided i think i should say something <laughs> it was really funny so he and, and he he gave a, a very thoughtful response and it was an interesting exchange but that whole theory is gone now right because frank depended on the universe oh i think it was it depended on the universe eventually collapsing back on itself and that's where you get the energy to generate this computer that has enough memory to resurrect everybody who ever lived. And then, and then somehow the far future humans will stop the collapse or something like that. But now it looks like the universe expands forever at an accelerating rate. Right. So what does that say about the future of all information? Right. Well, it shows that in the far future, we will, we'll, the universe will be, well, the universe there, or wherever you happen to be, we won't exist anymore, but uh, we'll be a very lonely place. The, uh, uh, you won't, we would never know of any other galaxies. Uh, right. uh, it's not clear to me whether we would know of the rest of our galaxy. I mean, a, a, as, the, as space expands, things that are gravitationally bound don't expand with it, right? So um, like the solar system, as, as space expands, gravity keeps things from flying apart. They, they keep the same distances and so forth. It's, it's space between objects between objects that are bound together that expand so anyway we may or may not see mm. i've seen it both ways uh, we may see just the milky way or, or we may just see our sun as the only mm. star of course our sun will be long dead by then so <laughs> right right <laughs> the sun. Uh, uh so well that you know that kind of living here right now it's interesting to contemplate being somewhere in some quarter of the universe that are living that many like 10 to the 100 or whatever it is years from now uh, because they would be like the ancients here in America, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the in the real in the Earth, uh, where, where they weren't aware of anything beyond the stars they could see. Yeah. Right. Well, this kind of gets and, up uh, gets us to your model dependent realism philosophy of science you present in the Grand Design. But before we get there, just just on a personal note about Stephen, in in your memoir you talk about him going to work. So you know he goes to the lab and. The, his graduate students are there and people that work with him are there and you go in and you meet with them. But how does that happen with somebody who can't speak? And that must've been quite, quite a different work environment. Oh, definitely. Well, it, it takes some getting used to. So the first thing obviously is, is, is communication. And when you first get to know him, you get, there's, a, there's a lot to really learn about how to communicate with him, even just sitting there. Because he was speaking at, so should I tell people yeah, yeah, how yeah, yeah, he yeah. communicated? So when I first met him, he still, he used his thumb. His, he could move his thumb, just like twitch it a little bit. And he had like an old-fashioned mouse on it, so he would twitch it when he needed to. And he would be looking at a screen, and on the screen there would be six or eight rows of letters. And there would be a cursor that flies around uh, row one, row two, row three, and so on. And when he was on the row that he wanted to write the letter on it, the proper letter, he would click and he'd get that row. So let's say the row is A, B, C, D, E. Then, so he got the first row. Then it would start going letter by letter, A, B, C, and he'd click again and he'd capture that letter. And then in another part of his screen, once he captured a letter, he'd have some suggestions. Hmm. I forgot what you call that, but it would suggest uh, words with that letter, common words that he's used. But, but he would go capture a second one and it would fill it. Would, and then once he had two words like BR, it would start giving him suggestions with mm. BR. And he could do something with his clicks to get over there and pick that mm. word too if he mm. wanted. So that process. And then, of course, there's a backspace because because of his disability, not only did he have very little movement, but it was a little, a little bit erratic. So sometimes he'd be a little early or late, get the wrong letter and he'd have to go mm. back and 
select the eraser mm. and, and tedious go back one and erase it. And it was amazing what he had to go through. But he could get about six words a minute in at first. And that eventually diminished. And then he had a, uh, a sensor put in on his glasses. And what that did was it measured the distance from his cheek to the sensor. And he would twitch his cheek, which um, makes the distance less. And that would be his, his click. So instead of the thumb, he would, he would twitch his cheek. Wow! And so he he um, he, he started to use to use that instead. And so you would sit there, and your conversation would uh, take a long time. So your conversation would take a <laughs> long time. So that's about a minute right. or so, so, just for that sentence. And you know, at first I would I don't know daydream, and at some point I start, I would start looking on the on the, you know, on, on the web, either about what we were talking about to find out more stuff, but where I would just sit there and go Zen like, <laughs> but pretty, pretty quickly, I learned that, um, that, 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 that kind of communication could have its advantages. So I started to focus myself mm. more and I could, um, at some point when I got to know each other better, I would come around and sit shoulder to shoulder with him so I could see what he was composing. So when you sit across from him, he would compose the sentence or the paragraph, and then he would click, you know, say it, and it would, it would his computer would read it to you. Um, he also had certain phrases that were canned that he mm. would just say, like, I, I want some mm. water or something. Right. But, but uh, so he would, um, you would sit there and, and facing him. But I started sitting by his side so I could see him as I could see the sentence start to take mm. shape. So I could actually, when I got to know him better, and this is the thing about Stephen, the better you knew him, the better you could communicate. So I could finish the sentences mm. for him. I, and I would say, do you mean, you know, and then he would go like this with his, you know, he, this was a yeah. yes. And, um, or, or no. And I, I learned that don't take too many chances because he gets annoyed if you start guessing <laughs> wrong. Too many, I mean, maybe one no, but if you guess two or three no's yeah. in a row, you feel like he wants to slap you, so you shut up. <laughs> But, but what I really so that it would speed things up. But but what it also did was I I could see his sentence forming. It gave me a chance to think about what he was saying. Mm. So it gave me it made our conversations in a way much mm. deeper because when I'm talking to you, you ask me something and I have to have I give you whatever answer I have that's in my head. I mean it's the best that I can do. But but, but because no one wants to wait five minutes for me to really ponder it, right? Right. Ponder what my response is going to be then. You know, people wouldn't tune in. And any everyday conversation, it's not you don't want to say something to someone and that person's mm, <laughs> right, right. you know, you want to answer. But with Steven, this was a very natural thing. So when I and, and he thinks faster than me. So so when I was able to uh, when I was talking to him, I could and I could kind of see where he was going, I could start to think about what he was saying, or sometimes even if I needed to look up something, you know, so that when he finished I, I could I could have much deeper answer mm. than if I had to answer spontaneously. Interesting. I got to, I got to know, but even deeper than that is what you, you get to know his facial expression. So sometimes you play twenty questions with him quite right. often. You don't really you say, "Do you think this?" And he'll go, "Yes or no." You know, so so a, a no would be like, mm. oh, right, and a yes is okay. like that, you know, or a smile. right, and he. So you would play 20 questions, um, but even deeper than that, you, you would say things and you could start reading his face, even more nuances, not just yes or no, but you kind of get a feeling for what he was thinking. It's almost like mind reading. And, and, and as you got to know him better, you could have those kinds of conversations. So the, the words he typed out would be part of it, but a lot of it was also the other thing. And, you, you know, and I would say, do you mean blah, 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 blah? And, and he'd go, yeah. Right. So, you know, it's something that, that developed with yeah. time. Yeah, the stories you have in there about that are incredible. And, and the number of carers. I always thought he just had one carer, but I guess there was a whole team of them. They had to cycle in and out. It's a 24-7 job. What a job that must have been. Yeah, it, it really was. And, uh, and amazingly <laughs> that he had this rich love life that, you know, he was married to Jane, then he was married to Elaine, and then he was almost married to Diane. And Elaine and Diane were carers, right, that fell in love with him, or they fell in love with each other. Yeah. yeah. So it's, yeah. It, it, it's yeah. such a testimony to the human spirit that, you know, you can fall in love with somebody who can't even move, could barely move, and, and hardly yeah. communicate, and yet it can still happen, which is really quite remarkable. Yeah. And he had that kind of a personality that you felt, I felt that, he felt really he could get really close to him, even though he couldn't move. It was a uh, it was 
unique, I think. And just as his physics was unique because he thought differently, um, he, was, he was unique in, in his interactions with humans because he communicated differently. He, he developed the, that yeah. kind of telepathic, not really telepathic, yeah. but semi-telepathic, <laughs> or seemingly yeah. telepathic method where you know what he's thinking based on his facial expressions. I mean, I think people, uh, psychologists who study emotion should have, should have studied him because they, they look for different right. things yeah. in your face. Yeah. In this, but. Also reading your, your memoir, I, I think I didn't know this, that the, the, the British healthcare system would not support his needs and, and even the university didn't have a budget to give him full-time care. So he had to write brief history of time just to make money to support himself in that sense. Right. Well, he got, I wouldn't say, and he wouldn't say that they didn't give him any support, but he, he didn't give him full mm. support. Okay. So I mean, the healthcare system, yeah. Uh, for example, I, 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 uh, it's in the book, but I, if I remember correctly, I, I don't think they would have, they were paying, like, they weren't going to pay for 24 mm. hour care. Uh, if I remember right, it, um, I mean, they pay for a certain level of care, or if he's in a home somewhere, then they would, he would have 24 hour care, but they don't have the money to, anybody who has something like that to supply at their home 24 hour right. uh, care. And it was intensive care yeah. too. It wasn't just, uh, uh, I mean, even, even at night I've talked about what his people don't realize his nights were such torture. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, he, he couldn't, for example, just one thing was he couldn't turn, right? Obviously he couldn't move, so he couldn't turn. As you get older, you start to get aches mm -hmm. and pains, right? <laughs> and he had they make some pains to everybody else, or even even if you're not older, if you're younger and you you're laying on one spot too long, that's why we turn in right. bed, and he can't do right. that. So um, his carers would would have to turn him every so often. They did their best, but if in between he he had some ache or something was mm. hurting him, he just had to live yeah. it. He couldn't do anything about it, and and he couldn't communicate when he was sleeping because he was detached from his computer. Obviously, he was in right. bed. They had to clear out his stoma sometimes. He would start to suffocate in sleep. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he breathed through a, uh, well, it, it, he breathed through a stoma, uh, like where he had a tracheostomy, and, and they would hear it gurgling. They would have come and clear right. it out. Later, he, he actually slept with a respirator mm -hmm. every night, so they would, he would be basically intubated. Oh. Every, I mean, that, I don't know, to me, that sounds yeah. like torture. But and then getting him up and getting him ready for the day. I mean. In the way they would have to bathe him, they, you know, at his house they had a sling, a, a motorized thing that they would attach him to, and it would lift him up and it would turn and put him in the bathtub, mm -hmm. and they would, you know, I mean, you know, if you see him on TV, that's a fairy right. tale right. viewpoint. You know, the, the, he's had the questions weeks in advance, and he's had he has the answers all composed. Yeah. So the interviewer says something, he's sitting there. And he answers it like you could have a conversation. That's not how right. it is. And and you see him; he's all dressed nicely, and you know, and he's sitting there looking good, smiling. You don't see behind the scenes what it takes to keep him alive, to get him through the night every night. I had one carer told me something I quoted in the book that was very touching. Was like every morning uh, when I, when I got him up and I, my shift was over, uh, I felt really good because I had simply kept him alive another wow. night. And it was wow. just, I know that. And kept him alive yeah. again another night. Um, so th that's what his life was like. I mean, I, I, even tiny little things that for me would be torture. He had to. He had to learn to accept. He had to learn to um, withstand. To 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 uh, you know to, to have such a Zen like approach to 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 life because he was so helpless. I remember walking in and seeing, you know, a, a drop of sweat. Yeah. I described yeah. in the book running brow and. And start to very very slowly go down, and I'm, I'm itching just watching this, right? And his parents sitting there reading her book, <laughs> right. is, once they're taking care of him for a while, they it, those they don't, not like me. I'm a fresh person there. I'm going, oh my god, a drop of sweat. They, yeah. they, you know, to them, if he's not choking to death. Everything's okay. <laughs> right. and, and I'm watching. I'm thinking that must really be torture. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, like I call it a, a, an elementary particle of Chinese <laughs> water torture or something. Yeah. Like, and, and I, you know, I would go and sometimes dab it away from him, and I think he appreciated that. But he, he had to, he had to grow to live in acceptance of that and not be bothered by by things that would just drive other people crazy. So he dealt with this for fifty years, and as you mentioned in the book, the average 
uh, lifespan once from diagnosis of ALS to death is two years. Uh, is there any possibility he didn't have ALS or he had some variation of it that was so different that it, it didn't stop his breathing muscles or swallowing muscles as soon that that's what normally kills ALS patients? Well, that's, that's possible. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I once had somebody walk up to me after I gave a talk and say that he was a researcher in ALS and had tested Stephen and that he had a certain kind of ALS that was rare mm. and, and, and less longer mm. living. That was then he, I didn't get his card. And later I didn't realize how much I'd like to talk to this yeah. guy. But I mean, I, is there anybody that's heard, lasted 20 years, much less 50? I, 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 no, oh, no, there, there are. are. There are. I, I think it was about 20% oh, of okay. them, I believe. Last more than a decade or something. So I there's a bell the book, curve, so and he's he, again six standard deviations out from the mean or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, to be fair, it's not just the the, the 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 quality of his ALS or the type of his ALS that that is important. It's the care that yeah. he had. Yeah. So uh, without that care that he had to make so much money to support, yeah. people will you know would live a lot less. Well, he he had such good care. And uh, not just that to keep his physical body alive, but to keep his mental, keep him wanting yeah. to live. Because imagine, let's say, someone who can't afford that, and now they're in some um, kind of hospital oh, yeah. or nursing home, and they don't have the computer with the yeah. communication. They're just like they're incommunicado, yeah. or they have, you know, that sheet, uh, that a letter board. The, the letter kind of where you point yeah. at, at letters and, 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 and to communicate. Those people... So they, they don't want the extraordinary care to keep them alive because they don't want to stay right. alive. So it was, it was not just the type of um, ALS that he had. And he probably had ALS. Again, I, I, I can't say for yeah. sure. Um, but, but again, um, the, the kind of confluence of, of his genius at that particular kind of ALS, whatever that is, and the care he had, and that he's trying to answer the biggest questions ever <laughs> about the nature of the universe and all and that, that stuff. We realized when he first got sick and he was depressed and he had, he had not, no idea, nothing to didn't know what he wanted to do in life. He thought, I, I want to answer these questions before I die. He thought he'd die. He thought he'd die by the end of the seventies. Yeah. So he was shocked that he wasn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't going, it was a shock as everybody else. So he else. reached yeah. out to you because he had read your Feynman's Rainbow book and, and or Euclid's, Euclid's Rainbow, and then no, those two yeah, books. yeah. And then uh, uh, you worked together on a, an update of Brief History of Time, a briefer history of time. But that was more of an update of his work. Uh, but the grand design is really quite the, an original contribution from both of you. And uh, I always liked, I liked the story in there about how, you know, Stephen liked to put provocative statements in there. I think the one you said was he, he said, philosophy is dead. And you're like, we can't put that in there. <laughs> Oh, yes, we can. <laughs> We're going to get hammered if we say that. So tell us the story about how you then developed model-dependent realism and what that means. Well, okay. I, so so it's funny because um, Stephen, as we were, we spent a year uh, talking about working on the, 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 the what I could call the plan for the book, the outline or the, what the contents are going to be. And, and he didn't want to, he wanted, it was going to be on his latest work and this viewpoint of the multiverse and, and the, how the universe is so extraordinarily fine-tuned for life. I mean, if I change very minor things about the laws of physics, the, the mass of the electron by a couple percent, there is no right. life as we know it. It's not possible. Right. The universe would have evolved so differently. And, but, but then his theory, his quantum theory of the creation of the universe has parallel universes, and it all comes together very nicely and explains things. And and he said then that he does, but he doesn't even want it to be just about that. He he wants to be about the his philosophy of <laughs> physics. And, and I'm thinking, okay, well that's fun. Okay, it's interesting. I mean, if people get older, like yeah. Yeah. physicists, you start to think a little bit more about what it means that you don't think about when you're younger. And now he's thinking about that. Let's put that in. And we're not philosophers, but um, I thought it's fine to talk about as a physicist what you think about the meaning of what you're doing and how the way you do it. Fine. Then one day I'm there. I'm in Cambridge working uh, with him. Uh, one of my visits there, and I got an email, and he, he wants to put this verbiage in. And I, I don't know it by heart, uh, um, word for word, but I still had the email, so it was like. Um, and he, in the, the words are in the book, so he's basically saying, um, he says, uh, you know, we, we started out using philosophy to understand the world, but today philosophy is dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well. 
this book is partly to explain the philosophy right. of, of physics and, and now philosophy is dead. And I, so I, anyway, I went to him and I said, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't even think it would be a big deal. I just said, well, I understand what you're saying here, but we should say, let, let me rewrite, let me edit that a little bit. Let's say as a way of understanding the natural world, philosophy is dead. I mean, because there's still ethics, there's still, uh, you know, philosophy of mathematics. What is mathematics? Right, there's right. still you know, a lot of philosophy that has nothing to do with 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 with, with describing how the moon orbits, right? right? So, so I said, let's just say that. And, and he goes, uh, no, <laughs> you know, he says, uh, he says uh, that has no punch. <laughs> punch, yeah. And I said, okay, I know it has no punch, but if we if we say it that if we don't qualify like that, well, first of all, I think you know it's not really right. And we're going to get hammered by people. And then he says again, you, like what, the same side, your way has no punch. <laughs> and then I argued one more time, right? I, I made some other point of you trying to convince him. And he has a way of turning up the volume <laughs> on what he says. So it's not always the same. And this came super loud. Your way has no punch. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right, well, we're going to put it, but we're going to get, you know, yeah. we're going to get, you know, hammered for it. And then he gave me a big like, smile, oh boy. you know, like, and he's like, <laughs> I can't yeah. wait, you know, bring it on. You know? <laughs> he, he liked creating controversy, I think. And it's true. I mean, he was totally right. His way had my, my way had no punch. His way had punch. I was right. We did get people upset by that, especially philosophers. And I've had a lot of explaining to do. Right. And, and, you know, but, you know, it, it, anyway, and I think it's clear from the context what we meant. But, but as a philosophy anyway, of physics, but, you're arguing that the the model you're using in a way determines the reality at least as it's perceived so yeah so his philosophy um was between there's a kind of there's a school of philosophy called realism mm -hmm. and a school called anti-realism so the um one, one school uh believes that what you're describing you're just faithfully using your senses to see what's going on out there and and you're reporting it so it's real and the other one um, is that you're like making up these these theories uh, in your head that may or you know that 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 don't necessarily. But you got getting a philosophy yeah. book out. I was gonna go ahead. I was just looking something up to read to you. There's no objective reality out there. It's just it's just the brain you theorizing about about right. you know about something. And his is kind of in between. So his his theory was that every theory okay that first of all a theory of physics is not really to be separated from uh the way your brain works so Kant talked about how our our brains have our, our senses are are a kind of um a barrier between us and whatever is or isn't out there it's all interpreted through right. our senses so that in modern terms you would say if you look at other animals for example a bat's perceptions and and of the world, theories of the world are different than ours, or we talk about goldfish yeah. in the book that store the curved space of goldfish. Yeah, give us that, walk us through that for just a moment. Oh, okay, so so yeah, so we're talking about how what our theories of the world are not just different because there's different physicists' theories, but also there's different ways that your brain architecture determines how you might view the world, and it's kind of the same thing. One is a mathematical expression of the other, but they're not really different. And as an example, we show, let's look at how goldfish look at the world and what their scientists might say. So there was a, a, a town in uh, Italy that banned curved goldfish bowls because they said it wasn't fair to the goldfish because it distorts the outer world. And what they meant was that because the, the, what we call the index of refraction of water is different than it is of air, light bends when it passes uh, from one to the other. And, and so if a goldfish were to be, to be sitting in your room and not surrounded by water, uh, it would see things very Newtonian, uh, an object moving along without a force on it would keep moving in a straight line. But when you put that goldfish in a curved bowl with water and if the way the light bends makes the, distorts that, makes that a curve. So things that are going, what we see as a straight line, if you're inside the curved goldfish bowl, you'll mm. see it curving. So the question is, let's suppose that there's a universe of a, a world of goldfish in the bowl who they can't get out, so they don't even know if there's an outside. They might theorize that there's something outside the bowl because they see these things moving around, uh, and, and, and they will come up with their physics of mm. that. And it'll involve curving things, not straight lines, stuff, right. right? And that'll be 
theory. So we'll have some Einstein number one or Newton coming up with that. Then some other Einstein number two will come along one day and come up with, with this idea that, oh, if light bends when it goes from the outer world to the inner world, then I can explain everything on the outside very simply. It all moves in a straight line, just like we do inside the mm -hmm. water. If I'm swimming and I stop paddling, I keep going straight. I don't curve. So this new Einstein of the fish Einstein would go, oh, my God, things move in a straight line there and here. What makes it look curved to us is that the, the interface between the water and, and we live in a curved mm -hmm. ball. So they'd have all these physicists, you know, the, the Newtonian fish and the Einsteinian fish, they'd be arguing. Um, some would say, which, you know, no, it's, uh, it's curved. And some would say, no, everything out there moves straight, but the water changes it. And the thing is that they can't get out there, right? Because no fish can go through it. So Stephen would say, this is like our, this is like hmm. us. We have certain experiences. We're the goldfish. And, and, and we see things this way. Then we come up with a quantum theory or a relativity and we say, no, it's really that way. We can't get outside the bowl, but, but that's really what's happening. And, and then people start discussing what's more yeah. real. And now to us, as I tell you this story, it seems that the outside way is more real and, and the stuff curves and the light curves when it hits the water because we're like God on the outside. Right. But if we were on the inside and no one could get outside, there is no way of saying whether that's true or mm -hmm. not, right? It may be or it may not be. You know, it may really be that that, that, that that's not the, the way it is. And so there's no way of really knowing. So Stephen would say, don't say that one is more real than the other. So reality depends on the way you look at it, the theory that you're using. Yeah. And, and that's why it's called model-dependent yeah. realism. So he believes in realism in the sense that, okay, you can, you can, you can look at it as an objective reality, but that reality is not fixed. It's different depending on the way your brain interprets things and the way your mathematical theories interpret things. So the, the goldfish reality is different from the bat reality, from my reality. My Newtonian reality is different from my uh, quantum reality. And depending on in physics, just like as I said, uh, they have, uh, scientists had to use sometimes general relativity and quantum theory, but they clash and then you use a little bit of this, yeah. a little bit yeah. of that. Well, your reality in, in general relativity is much different than your reality in quantum theory. So instead of about worrying about which is more real or even how to mesh them, you just go give up and go, no, that's not true. It's this is the reality for this. This is the reality for that. And no one has to make them har harmonize. And that was very Feynman-like, mm. by the way, because Feynman did not believe in, in, in the unified theory. He didn't like string mm. theory. Then why do, why do we have to have a quantum theory of gravity or a unified theory of all the forces? That's up to nature to tell us. It's not up to us to tell nature whether such a mm. thing exists. It's up to nature to decide. And maybe nature made it so that there is yeah. none. And that's kind of what Stephen yeah. thought. Yeah. So uh, if if the book is here and it has a sharp edge and, 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 and so forth, you and I see it one way. The bat sees it some other way because it's, it's bouncing sonar off of there and however that registers in its neural networks and its little brain is going to be completely different from the way our brains process it. But there really is a book here. Well, you say yeah. that, but the bat say there really isn't a book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me read you this little uh, passage from Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington's book, the philosophy of physical science. I think this was like 1927. Let us suppose that an ichthyologist is exploring the life of the ocean. He casts a net into the water and brings up a fishy assortment. Surveying his catch, he proceeds in the usual manner of a scientist to systematize what it reveals. He arrives at two generalizations. One, no sea creature is less than two inches long. Two, all sea creatures have gills. In applying this analogy, the catch stands for the body of knowledge which constitutes physical science and the net for the sensory and intellectual equipment which we use to obtain it. The casting of the net corresponds to observation. An onlooker may object to the first generalization and say it's wrong. There are plenty of sea creatures under two inches long, only your net is not adapted to catch them. The ichthyologist uh, dismisses this objection contemptuously. Anything uncatchable by my net is ipso facto outside the scope of ichthyological knowledge and is not part of the kingdom of fishes which has been defined as the theme of ichthyological knowledge. In short, what my net can't catch isn't fish. <laughs> Is that similar to what you're arguing? Uh, it, it's definitely re related because what we're saying is that the, the, the net, you know, is our senses and our minds. And it's also our cognitive abilities. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Um, like when you look, look, when you're born as, as an infant, uh, the infant does not see the book. Right. Okay. The infant is getting bombarded with data that it does not understand. Its visual cortex is not developed. It sees, I don't, God knows what it sees or how it interprets it, but it's wiring its brain through its first few years. And it gets to where we go. We agree like the theologist that that's a book. Now, um, we have limits. And I don't mean by limits, meaning necessarily like the two inches or, or less. Uh, I, I mean, limits in general defined by the nature by which our brains work. And, and, and another creature that has a, a brain that works in a different paradigm, look at an octopus, mm. which is, has a brain distributed nervous system and brain distributed all over its body. I mean, who knows what it perceives? Yeah. Such creatures might perceive things uh, completely differently. And, and there might be no easy, and it's hard for, yeah. I mean, it's hard yeah. to talk about this because I can't give you an example. It's like trying to say picture six dimensional <laughs> right. space. Can't do it. So, but you can talk about it. And, and, and those creatures might not see anything like, like oh, and it happens to be my book, <laughs> like, right. like a book, right? But when they move around the world, they interact with this in a successful way, then their method is as valid as mine. So if I, they're moving their head and they go around what we think yeah. is a book, and to them, to them it might be, I mean, I can't even right. describe it, it might be a sound right. that, that's coming in this year and it says move yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. They don't even see right. anything. I don't know. <laughs> if they move and they get out of the way, they're as successful as we are. And, and, you know, bats, which are pretty blind, blind as a bat, you know, and, and, but, but they're, I don't know exactly how blind, so don't call me on that, but, but they perceive things using their sonar. Uh, obviously, their, their, their perception of the world is not going to match ours. Right. Just, I mean, right. it's hard, probably inconceivable. But it's also important to understand that our theories of the world, and as a theoretical physicist, I come across this every day when I'm working on a problem. I'm very aware of my limitations. And some of them are my own personal limitations compared to, say, Hawking, right? But some of the, my limitations as a human being, like, for instance, I always wish I had a greater working memory. You know, the working mm -hmm. memory is the part of your memory. It's not more long-term. It's things that as, I, as I'm talking and thinking about something, I'm keeping various facts and ideas in my mind. And sometimes when you're doing physics, you need a bigger <laughs> one. And, and, and some, some being with a very, very much bigger one could, could see through what I'm struggling with in, in like that much time. And they may think geometrically more like Stephen and God knows ways that I can't mm. even imagine and think that my little things that I'm doing with equations are silly. Like, mm. you know, kind of like if you see a squirrel going like that, that's how silly they think <laughs> it is. So you have to expand your mind and allow these things in. Then I think you're driven to this model dependent realism. Yeah. And the name came because I, 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 I very dutifully took a philosophy of science book into Stephen <laughs> to, and I was talking about always between realism and anti-realism, and it depends on models. So I say I, I'm going to kind of show him these passages for him to read and talk to discuss why I want to call it model-dependent realism. And he doesn't. He, he's just like doesn't want to read the book at all, but he likes the name because <laughs> it has punch. <laughs> oh, that's the name. <laughs> yeah, it has punch. I <laughs> guess. Funny. Yeah. Even the name of your book, the Grand Design. He thought. Nature. I mean, of course, you know, in my Sorry? the Grand Design, the name of the book. I mean, in my world, of course, I, I, I worry that you know creationists are going to glom onto that and go, "Aha, you see, there's a designer behind the design." But of course, you're saying that the design comes just falls out of the equations or or whatever. It's just in the nature of of the universe without a designer. But I don't want to put words in your mouth. How, how do you guys interpret that? No, oh, I think you said it well, and, and that's the whole point. The, the, the grand, I, I, you know, I'm hoping that people who believe in the, the grand designer read the book because the book is about why you don't right. need one. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so it would be good to open their minds. And, and, uh, but we're not saying there isn't one. We're just saying you don't need right. one. Right. So the book is about how the universe could, could come from nothing and could have appeared from nothing and how the laws of physics and why they are what they are today. And so the grand design is really that. It's, it's that um, the grand design is randomness, really. Yeah. The grand design is that, that a universe can appear from nothing, and according to Stephen's theories, an infinite or at least humongously large number of universes start did crop up. Um, most of them never got anywhere. They, 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 they go through something we call inflation. They get bigger, but then they recollapse mm -hmm. quickly. And, and some of them, like ours, have a, a longer lifetime in which things can evolve, living things can evolve. A lot of those have the wrong laws because in, in his theory, all these universes have different laws. And if they have laws that don't allow living things to develop, then living things won't develop. But obviously 
if you are a living thing, then you're in one of those other universes that, that, that allows right. them, right? So, so um, that's so that's the grand. So the grand design is really that 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 all kinds of random universes were there, and we happen to you know we are the offshoot of one one particular kind of universe, and it came from nothing. But you know, we never talk about the fact. We don't say that 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 means there's no right. God. Uh, it could be a God because we see no evidence of God. We say right. that uh, you know all all the physics that we do. There never has to be a you know one of those steps that um, um, Sidney Harris put into his famous <laughs> yeah, cartoon. Yeah, America. Yeah, I love the story you tell. Miracle. I love the story you tell in the epilogue. Uh, uh, Bantam published the grand design in September 2010, and then all of a sudden you get a call from uh, one of Stephen's assistants, Judith, and she's agitated. Leonard, we need your help. I had no idea what she was talking about. You said, "Have you seen the Times?" And you go, "The New York Times? Yeah, I read it. No, not the New York Times. The London Times." <laughs> anyway, well, Google it and look at the headline, and it says, Hawking, God did not create the universe. <laughs> so you can see, of course, he must have loved that, like, aha, that has punch. <laughs> Even though yeah. that wasn't what you were well, saying. It, it wasn't what we were saying, and, and um, you know, but that controversy obviously was not bad for the book. And we were condemned by the Catholic Church, by you all were? sorts of people. Umberto Eco uh, wrote something, a diatribe. Uh, some people attack Stephen personally, saying that he was, uh, I think, making atheism into oh, a, right. uh, or no, marketing his disability oh, right. and, 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 and profiting from his atheism, or I don't know what. Actually, Stephen, as I say in the book, did not want to be considered yeah, an atheist. Yeah. Or he, at least he wanted to say what he felt, but he wanted to keep it low key. He didn't want to insult anybody as he compared himself to yeah. Richard Dawkins. He did not want to be like Richard Dawkins. So it was really ironic that people who imagine that they can see into his brain but never met him, you know, would think that. Right. But. So how would you describe him? Is it sort of a, a, an agnostic in the sense that Huxley meant it, that it's a not a knowable concept ultimately through science, whether there's a God or not? I, I would say, yeah, that he would. I mean, he may have, you know, when we talk, uh, he may have, uh, I don't think he ever said I'm an atheist, but I mean, he, he, did, he I think I think he didn't believe in God. Hmm. He definitely did not believe in God, but he didn't believe in God because there was no evidence for it. So I think if you pressed him, he would he would have classed himself classified himself as agnostic because he he would not say there's a proof that there isn't God either, right? So he's not he's not really saying I know there's no God. Right. He's saying I use Occam's razor and get rid of all the right. stuff that I don't right. need in my theory. Right. right? I wonder if he would have embraced Ein, you know, Einstein's famous uh, line about uh, g g believing in the God, Spinoza's God, you know, the laws of nature, some kind of pantheistic idea. Yeah. Well, we talked about that, and, and he said that that's fine if you want to call it that, but he thought that that was this mere semantic, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's just a uh, semantic exercise because that's not what people generally mean. It's not the spirit of God people are talking right. about. If you want to say that God is the laws of nature, that's fine. But 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 people, when they talk about God, are talking about, uh, even if it's not literally the Bible, they're talking about something that affects their lives, that maybe affects their, it has to do with their soul, or uh, that God is watching over them in some way, or punishing people in right. other ways, or, you know, something. But, but a God that is completely detached from humans and merely is the, embodied in the laws of nature, that most people don't. And they, at that point, God is uh, devoid of, of what people think yeah, of, you know, yeah. that kind of yeah. You know, this idea of the of Mysterians, uh, there's these Mysterian mysteries, mysteries that cannot even in principle be explained just because of the limitations of our brains uh, and the, all the stuff you talked about, the limitations of our models and our sensory apparatus and equipment and, and so forth. We, we'll just never really know what reality is. Um, and although some t people feel they go too far, I don't, I don't know. Well, it depends what they're talking about. I mean, I probably have to agree with the statement. We will never know what reality really is. I mean, cause I, I kind of, i I believe with Steven in the model dependent realism. Yeah. So I don't think that, how can you say ever that uh, I've stepped out of my right. yeah, body and my yeah, senses? Yeah. The universe that really is. Well, let me let me uh, let me rephrase know. it. So, say you have this upper ceiling here of 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 knowledge, and and science is a sort of asymptotic curve that's growing ever closer to it. Even though it never reaches it, there's the idea that science is making progress. We're getting closer to reality, or the models are better than they used to be. 
No, I don't okay. agree. Um, look, the, the closest that we ever wanted that we could get probably to our everyday reality uh, was Newton's mm. theories. Uh, and they, they describe, uh, except for, you know, modern man-made things based on quantum theory, but in the everyday natural world, if you go to the jungle or a mountain, you know, that's not full of computers, uh, Newton's laws are 100% yeah. accurate yeah. to whatever accuracy you can see. And that's the reality you experience. The Now, what about quantum theory? You could say that there's another deeper reality. I'm probably guilty of saying that. Sometimes those are all shortcuts, but I don't really mm -hmm. mean that because the word reality is not really as deeper. It, it, it means that something else, seem, you know, there's another picture, another set mm -hmm. of concepts that, that you apply to the microscopic world, to the atomic world, the subatomic world that describes that. But even to call that another reality is really weird because um, in that world, things aren't even really real. I mean, let's just say you are, if you were a, a, a proton or, you know, you would not be, you would not be real on your own because Jennifer is in the, in the next room and you're in a, in a wave function <laughs> with her. And, and I can't say that your particle is here and the other one's there because you're all, you know, combined yeah. in the wave function and tangled and, and, and you don't have your own separate identity. You don't have a position. So what, what kind of reality, I don't know what kind of reality I'm talking about. People are still arguing about if we lived in that world, how would we define reality? Right. Who knows? Right. But then I'm saying, what about Einstein's relativity? It totally conflicts with that, and it tells you a different. Einstein's yeah. theory says in a way that the universe, has, everything that happened in the universe, in a way, this is a, a real, this is a real no-no. What I'm going to say, it already happened, which <laughs> doesn't mean it's meaningless. But you have a feeling for yeah. what I mean. But that it's all, the universe is like a loaf of right. bread, and you stick a needle through it, timeline. But it's all kind of there, and, and things happen differently depending on what direction you stick the needle through. Let's just say it's totally different than quantum theory. And there's evidence that we're going to have to throw out all these theories or revise them greatly because of the you know dark energy and dark matter, right. which we don't really understand. Right. There, 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 you know, there, there may be completely different descriptions. So to say that, I mean, if you say Newton's laws, if you look at Newton's laws and our macroscopic reality, I can understand your your metaphor that we're going like that, that's just Newton's laws because we're developing his laws more, we're learning mathematically how to apply them, and we're getting better and better. Yeah. But then I wouldn't say that this part is Newton's laws and now quantum theory is this right. part. You gotta throw that away and start over <laughs> okay. with quantum theory. Right. You know? right. So it's not like a continuous thing. It's it's a thing where you're you're looking at it this way. No, turn on your head and look at it that right. way. And then but who's to say that, you know, uh, you know, fifty years from now we're gonna look at it a completely different yeah. way. It could happen. And and there are there are real reasons out there to believe that it ha happened. You know, like I said, dark energy, dark matter. You know, people don't really understand why why there's matter and not antimatter. There's some explanations, right, right. but but I don't think there's one dominant explanation to why to why that happened. Um, there's all sorts of mysteries in physics, so uh, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't fall into the trap that I think people did around the 1900, where they said we've got it pretty much all figured out right. except for a few little things, and those few little blew up everything <laughs> except for the the landmines over there <laughs> right. it's all figured out you know? yeah one of my book, one, one of my favorite arguments to make for the the value of being cryonically frozen and brought back say 500 years from now would, would be just to find out what they think reality is or or you know it'd be like oh that quantum physics oh no no we dumped that a century ago we we now have this or or dark energy dark matter we figured that out 200 years ago and here's what it is oh i see here consciousness no problem we got the neural networks of consciousness all figured out or, you know just or just like completely different a totally different worldview that you and i wouldn't even con conceive of well number one i would love to be able to do that and number two, um, it, it, as you alluded to just now, it, it, it won't be you wake up and they tell you it. Um, if you think of, uh, say, uh, uh, Kepler or Galileo, you know, woke up today, uh, it, it would not be an easy task mm. to, uh, to explain quantum theory. I mean, not just that they don't have any idea of the mathematics. They don't have any idea of the approach, the kind of concepts mm. that we use, the mm. way we think, the thinking back then. And I know from writing my books was so different that it, 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 if you jump 500 years, it, it, it's almost like they're aliens right. and you could hardly have a discussion with them. Um, like, uh, I remember reading about Orem, uh, who invented graphs, a, a French fellow, and, and he, when he, he, he had, was graphing 
something. I forgot what it went up and it went down. And that was a huge revelation that you could actually uh, pictorially represent that. But he thought that the part where it bent uh, would, would, would hurt you. So that, 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 that as, as things went up and, and the fact that it then suddenly started going down would cause pain to whoever that was happening to. So it was just took it in a very literal yeah. way that, does, that, that you can't even understand right. today. Um, yeah, the models of, say, 15th century physics, cosmology or whatever, are just so radically different. It's hard for us to even imagine what they were picturing in their minds. Yeah, they're thinking their ways of reasoning, what they would accept as logically obvious. Yeah. Is not what we yeah. would um, accept. Um, and, you know, and for instance, and Newton, for example, um, who was the real model of analytical thinking, as you yeah. know, uh, believed alchemy, um, thought that in the Bible there were hidden secrets about uh, when the world would end, and saw no conflict between right. that and, and his right. well, reason. So hard to not impose what we know. Well, the curse of knowledge. I can't not know what we know. And therefore, when I right. read some history of science, it's like, how can they not see this obvious thing? Well, I wrote about yeah. that in Elastic. That, that, that's the, uh, the, the curse of expertise, right. because it, it's very hard to be imaginative and to see new things and to take things a step further. The more you know about right. the way we things are now, the less likely it is that you're going to figure out the next <laughs> <Right>. step. <laughs> yeah. <If> I, <laughs> that's why I try to be as ignorant as right. possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Leonard, I know you got a hard out in a couple of minutes for your next interview. You're doing you're doing your book tour virtually, like all of us have had to do. Uh, I love the final page of your book here. We can get used to anything, and we can accomplish, if not anything, then at least much more than we give ourselves credit for. To grow close to Stephen was to understand this and to realize that we need not wait for debilitating disease to inspire us to make the most of our time on Earth. And so I continue to do physics and write my books. To those who knew Stephen from afar, it would appear that, for him, just to live was to climb Mount Everest. After I got to know him, it struck me that he was Mount Everest, an immovable giant immune to the passage of time and able to withstand even the most violent storms nature hurls at it. And then you close out by saying, basically, he controlled even his death. He just decided, I've been pushing and pushing pushing it back against entropy my whole life. I'm just going to stop pushing. I, 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 that's just such a powerful way to put it, because in a way, that's what we all do. I mean, we're all pushing back against the second law of thermodynamics that's just causing everything to run down, and the goal in life is to get up and do something anti-entropic, right? And, uh, yeah. and at some point, yeah. you just you, you give up in a way, I guess, and, uh, and, and your descriptions of how Stephen did that is just so moving. Well, thank it you. must thank have been you, something else to know him. Yeah, it really was. It changed my life, and uh, I think it did for everyone who was close. Yeah, to I'm him. glad you wrote the book so that so, so that people can get a really a really good feel, not just for the science and physics, of course, but for him as a person. So, thank you for doing that. And congratulations on the book. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye, Len. Bye, bye. Nice to see you again. Bye bye. Bye bye. You too.